Okay, so thank you very much. I'm uh, Sharon Hesterly. Some of you know me because I worked for PPMD for a while, and I have since gone to several other places and am now currently working for Aspio, which is a gene therapy company. So I'm very excited to hear about the results that we heard yesterday, and um, happy to open this session where we're going to focus a little bit more on the immune system. So I'll just say, to preference the introduction, that 20 years ago when I started in the field, there were only three problems with gene therapy, and that was delivery, delivery, and delivery. So I, as time has gone by, we've made great progress with delivery, and then we became aware that we had to learn how to make enough vector to treat people. So production became delivery and production. We've gotten better at production. We haven't solved it yet, but we're getting better. And I think that brings us to an immune response. So you heard the importance of being able to redose or being able to treat people who have pre-existing immunity is, is a very big deal here. And you know, in any biologic, not just gene therapy, but anytime you're delivering a protein to the body, you can potentially stimulate an immune response from the body. So there's sort of an art to figuring out how to tamp down the immune responses that allow a therapeutic to work without overdoing it and sort of immunocompromising a person. And so we've heard great progress. So today we're going to hear from two speakers for this session, uh, Dr. Carrie Michelli, who's a professor of microbiology and immunology and molecular genetics at UCLA. She's also the co-director of the Center for Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy. So Dr. Michelli is going to sort of do an overview of innate and acquired immunity. Um, and then. Dr. Jude Samulski, who is um, a professor of pharmacology at UNC and also the co-founder of Aspio, which is a gene therapy company. Um, he's worked in the gene therapy field for 40 years. He's the past president of the ASGCT, the Society for Gene Therapy, and received the first Lifetime Achievement Award by that organization. And I should also mention he was involved in the very first um, AAV trial for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which wasn't just an intramuscular injection. So that was almost more than 10 years ago now. So Dr. Samolsky is going to talk about overcoming neutralizing antibodies. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Michelli. Sharon and Pat for inviting me. Um, I am going to try and give a broad overview of the immune response so that those of you who are less familiar with it can begin to understand the vocabulary and the challenges uh, that are being posed in Duchenne dystrophy. So does this really point? All right. So all immune responses um, are designed either to be involved in self, non-self discrimination. So that's such as um, you have an, a virus invading you and you need to say, oh, this is not self. I need to reject you and, and, and clear you. Um, there's also roles for the immune response in self tolerance. And that's to control against autoimmunity. If, if one of my self tissues sort of gets damaged and presents itself to the immune response, you want to make sure that you quell that response so that you don't get an autoimmune reaction. So that's the second. Uh, function of the immune response. And then a third function that we're learning more recently about the immune response is that it's essential in guiding regeneration of tissues. And so all of those issues are at play in Duchenne. All response, immune responses begin with innate immunity. That's the first line of defense. And it's activated by cells that have preformed recognition of things that sort of look dangerous. And so they're called danger-associated molecular patterns. And those are things like viral capsids, that looks like a virus. Single-stranded DNA kind of looks like a virus. Double-stranded DNA looks like someone harmed their tissue. We should send out the first line of defense as our first job, and as a second job, we should alert the adaptive immune response. So the immediate effects in the first 12 hours of, of getting a challenge is that these innate immune effectors are activated. And these can be uh, cells like dendritic cells or NK cells. And upon activation, they can secrete uh, armory of weapons that are immediately effective towards ameliorating the threat, perhaps complement pro-inflammatory cytokines, 
uh, the initiation of just barriers that keep things from going to the right place. So once you have the innate uh, immunity activated, sometimes that, that first round of, of defense is enough to clear the whole response. But in the event that it's not, the innate immune response says to these adaptive immune response, I need your help. And so the way it does that is it turns up molecules and brings in cytokines that tell B cells and T cells that she should be activated and expand. And unlike the innate immune response, which sort of kind of sees viruses or kind of thinks they saw a damaged cell, the adaptive immune response is exquisitely specific. It sees things like capsid protein peptide, you know, A through D. Very, very small little peptides, very specific. And that's because each B cell or each T cell has on its surface a unique receptor that sees some little peptide and is expanded in response to that. So a B cell or a T cell sits around waiting its whole life to see the peptide of its dreams, right? And then it's expanded into an army of clones to either eliminate that or maybe to help promote regeneration or perhaps to help with tolerance induction. And so the reason why it's called the adaptive immune response is because it's adaptive. The first time you assimilate a T cell, it will, or B cell, they will expand and fight off the, the invader, but then they will contract and leave present still a memory of what they've seen. And you all know this, if you go and get a vaccine, you get vaccinated against a specific flu. And so you don't catch that specific flu because you already have memory cells that are more abundant than the precursors before and more potent. They're better at what they do. So we don't even know that we're infected. I have been vaccinated against the flu. I'm sure you all have been as well. And so maybe I got infected. I just didn't know it because I cleared it before it was able to truly get in and proliferate. And that, that is the goal of the adaptive immune response, is to have a selective memory that I saw this before, I'll likely see it again, I'd like to do it faster and stronger so there's no risk this time that I would even uh, succumb to the issues. Now, B cells you've heard a little bit about, those are the ones that make antibodies. And we've heard a lot about that in the context of the antibodies that have the potential to um, cloak the, the viral capsid and keep it from properly infecting uh, the cell. T cells come in multiple flavors. You can have T cells that are aggressive, like cytotoxic T cells that can go and lyse a virally infected cell. Or you can have T cells that are tolerizing, that say no matter what, don't mess with this one. Or you can have cells that are regenerative, that say, okay, it's time for you to satellite cell, for instance, activate, proliferate, and, and turn into a muscle. So this is just to show you uh, an example of how the immune response controls regeneration. And that happens actually in muscles. So that if I were to get an acute injury, you know, stab myself in the arm with a pencil or something, the first thing that would happen is there would be tissue damage. And you can see that day one, day two. By day four, you've got this nice inf uh, response of, of immune infiltrate, whose job it is, is to guide this healing of this wound. And it does so. And then by day seven, it's resolved. It's over. You're not constantly you know, healing the wound. You heal it as an immune response and go away. And the second bottom part is just to show you that in the absence of the immune response, if you get rid of like macrophages, which are a major player, you don't get proper muscle regeneration. It's the immune response that's guiding this. And if we dig deeper into how that happens, it happens through the orchestration of the, the recruitment of cells in a very ordered way. First come in these innate cells, the neutrophils, the mast cells, the complement system. And they sort of say, okay, let's have some pro-inflammatory reaction. Let's bring in some adaptive immunity, like T cells and macrophages. And then ultimately, those cells guide the, the, 
the recruitment and activity of a second set of cells. And this is grossly oversimplified. Uh, Tregs and perhaps M2 macrophages, and those are involved in resolving this, this wound healing effect. And that's coordinated. The, the, the types of things that they secrete you know, are, are useful if they're done in the proper order. For instance, at first you want to have something that detects the death of the injured muscle cells and activates the satellite cells. Well, the innate immune response plays a role in that, so that works out really nicely. Then the next thing you want to do is tell those satellite cells to differentiate and to expand, and you want to clear out some of the death and debris that's around. So all those things happen in an ordered event, and then ultimately when it's time to be done, in come these T regulatory cells uh, and these M2 macrophages. And the field has become quite fascinated with these, these T regulatory cells because they seem to have incredible powers, right? What they can do is induce tolerance in an antigen-specific way. And we've known that for a long time throughout the body, but what we've learned recently is that the T regs in muscles are specialized. They don't only maintain tolerance and suppress inflammation, but they also promote tolerance block fibrosis, and um, uh, uh, <laughs> sorry, I got distracted. Uh, they block fibrosis and um, induce tolerance and promote regeneration. So these are all things that would be great to have involved in um, immune response. Now, in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, you don't get this ordered event of these cells coming in in the right order because you try to initiate an innate response that's going to turn into an adaptive response and resolve because there's a muscle injury. But somewhere else in the muscle, there's another injury. So before the first one can resolve, you start making the factors at the beginning instead of the ones for resolving. And so you end up getting this sort of chronic activation that drives fibrosis. And that's quite unfortunate, of course. And so what that's done, and this is again uh, uh, talking about the special population of T regulatory cells that have the capacity to um, block fibrosis, promote muscle generation, and suppress specific inflammatory responses. And one of the excitements about this is that there were two groups that not only identified these cells, but were involved in showing, in, at least in the mouse, in the MDX mouse, if you upregulate them, it's good for disease. If, you know, it's good for us. It's, good. it's bad for the disease and good for the boys. Um, and if you downregulate it, it, it uh, worsens it. So these are really important players that are there to begin with, but that we might be able to manipulate to better lead to the resolution of the wound healing and to um, block the fibrosis as well as induce tolerance. So the first question is, if this really is an immune reaction that's driving, driving wound healing and that's defective in Duchenne, could we possibly uh, identify some of the known inhibitors of uh, immunity that are available to the autoimmune community or in the transplantation community and see if you could use some of those same drugs to um, promote regeneration and limit fibrosis. And this is just a list of immune modifiers that I have either been tried in mouse models, some in human, and ultimately the goal would be um, to find ones that do exactly what we want, limit the fibrosis, promote the generation, and induce tolerance to self. Okay, so what you all really want to talk about is the immune response in the context of these dystrophin replacement therapies, because that's what you've been hearing a lot about today. And. Um, So the question is, will there be an immune response that limits safety or efficacy of these dystrophin replacement therapies? Keep in mind that exon skipping, nonsense read-through, and gene therapy all are trying to make dystrophin in boys that have never had it. So to the body, there's the possibility that that new dystrophin protein looks foreign. They've never seen it before. It's never been tolerized to before. And so there's the possibility that that transgene is going to be cleared, and that would be the last thing you'd want is to have all the cells that are now expressing a new dystrophin be eliminated. Um, so that's a potential problem there. 
When you're talking about gene therapy, that problem is aggravated. Because not only are you taking a dystrophin protein or, or DNA encoding a dystrophin and protein and packaging it into a viral vector, that viral vector is a virus. The innate immune response is going to say, oh my goodness, there's a virus. Should we clear this? Now, AAV was selected because it's known to be not very immunogenic. So that's why we've spent years and years getting to this place. But by the same token, we do know that there is some immune response to AAV. And so the real question is, can we either sneak under the radar and evade the immune response, or can we specifically tolerate against those antigens so that they think, we think that's self, and the boys could just incorporate it as if that's part of themselves. So those are, and then finally, if you do put in the dystrophin, is it able, after the disease has started a bit, to reverse all of this immune pathology, to reverse the fibrosis, to encourage the regeneration? We don't know, but those would be the goals of this sort of immune modulation. So we've heard a lot about how there are uh, three companies with different, slightly different transgenes, how those transgenes are packed into an AAV capsid. And that capsid functions a bit like a Trojan horse, right, to take this transgene and deliver the payload to the cell. Uh, different companies are using slightly different capsids, slightly different transgenes, which may have different efficacy, but may also have different immunogenicity. So this is from a review from uh, Mingozi and Hi-Kathy. These are the folks from Sparks Therapeutics that have um, approved treatment for congenital blindness, for instance. And, and Mingozi has been thinking about the immunology here for quite a while. And so the summary points from 2017 are that there has been long-term efficacy in humans in a variety of diseases, but we know there is an immune response at some level. And so then the question is, how bad is it? Or is it maybe good? So thus far, as of 2017, there were no serious or permanent consequences of those immune responses other than transient asymmetric and uh, elevation of enzymes, liver enzymes, in, in, which indicated in those cases liver cell death. But it was, you know, recovered and folks were fine. We don't know if that's going to happen in Duchenne. Those were in other diseases. We have a little experience in Duchenne. You heard about some of the adverse effects potentially earlier in, in the meeting. Um, one of those th issues might be complement activation, which is a, a piece of this innate immune response. It's saying, hey, hey, look at this. I see something bad. Um, so certainly in seronegative patients, there's the possibility that you see AAV. You think this is a problem. You clear it. Or maybe you could tolerate against it. In patients that have already seen AAV in the wild, that's a different circumstance. Those people have just been immunized to AAV in the wild, and now you're going to come back and ask it to accept this viral DNA thing as self when you just told it it was a foreign antigen and that you should remember that. So that's going to be a big challenge for, re for uh, the folks that are uh, AAV seropositive, but I don't think it's a, a challenge we can't overcome. It's just one that we need to know the details of so that we can figure out what to target and how to do it. And it might take some time. So the first question is why are AAV seropositive boys excluded from the trials? And the answer is that a gross, uh, many of, of the boys with DMD have antibodies against AAV already, because they've been exposed in the wild, likely when they were toddlers with toddler behavior, you know, sw swapping spit and the kind of things that toddlers do. And so uh, you end up with a situation, and you've seen different numbers in different cases. Here's a paper where someone's seen up to 40% of the patients have antibodies to AAV. And those antibodies can coat the viral capsid, as you can see there, and if it's coated, it cannot properly infect. It's neutralized, essentially. It can't do its job of infecting and, and delivering the payload. And so the answer is why not give it to people who are AV positive? It's, it's futile. It won't even get in, unless maybe you can lower that antibody concentration and sneak in, or prevent that from ever happening. So a few strategies. So, here it is just showing you in the context of, of the cell 
that if the virus is trying to infect the cell, if it's coated with preformed antibodies, that ends up being a problem. So there are potential solutions for preformed antibodies that folks have talked about. The first one is to select patients with low or no neutralizing antibodies, which of course is not very satisfying to anybody who has them. But it is a strategy, and that's the strategy that people are starting with. Uh, fortunately, there are other strategies in, in, in the queue, some with more hope than others. One idea is plasmapheresis. That's basically just washing the antibodies out of your bloodstream. You know, they circulate, wash them out. That's transient, so you can only wash your blood for a little while, and you're not getting rid of the cells that make those antibodies, so they'll come back. But maybe you can wash it out fast enough quickly that you could sneak something in before, uh, you know, you manage to make something new. Another option is to use some of these immunosuppressives that people have used in autoimmunity and transplantation and see if we can't quell the immune response or maybe induce tolerance. And um, I'm less enthusiastic about the others. Uh, so there's pre-existing antibodies. A lot of people have talked about that. There could also be pre-existing T cells because um, AAV is immunogenic, it makes CD8 T cells, cytotoxic T cells that can in lyse infected cells. If those are pre-existing, again, you wouldn't want to have it so that you have these T cells that are right there primed and ready as a memory response to clear out the infected cell. That would be unfortunate. And so some trials are screening for people who have preformed T cell immunity and excluding them as well. The data for whether or not the T cells are functioning in clearing gene therapy, uh, the jury's out in that. There's debate. There are some that believe that, yes, you can see that they exist, but whether they exist in, and are doing something, or if they exist and just don't get to the right place in time to do something, is the controversy. But the concern came in part from uh, the first gene therapy trial uh, done in Duchenne that was an intramuscular injection where they monitored the blood, and they did find that some patients had preformed T cells, and that after immunization with the gene therapy vector, some of those T cells were expanded. And that was coincident with a failed trial. It doesn't mean one caused the other, but it sort of makes you wonder. So that's been um, an active area of investigation. It's been less of an issue for folks who have been targeting healthy muscle with AAV, because the reason people target muscle is because it's an immune privileged site. It doesn't have all of the goodies you need to get an immune response revved up. But in Duchenne it does, right? We've got this pro-inflammatory reaction that's turning up on the surface of those antigen presenting cells, things that say, hey, adaptive immunity, look at me. You know, go ahead and, and respond. And so that happens in response to the inflammatory reaction that's happening in Duchenne, and so we might have a harder time. We might not, but it could be that these muscles are already primed to tell the immune response that this is something's up. This is um, some recent work, a journal clinical investigation from Mingozi work, that um, shows us that people who've been exposed to AAV their T cell and, and immune repertoire looks different than those who have not seen it. In fact, if you take an AAV seronegative donor and stimulate it in culture with the vector, that donor will produce an NK, T, an NK response. And we know this because we can now deeply immune profile things. And by looking at the surface antigens, we can say, ah, this is the type of cell you are, this is how you function. And so when they did that, they saw, in fact, oh, with the serum negative donors, you get an NK response that doesn't seem to have that much immediate consequence. On the other hand, when the AAV2 seropositive donors were used and they were stimulated with AAV2, you could see that instead of just initiating that innate NK response, they're now initiating uh, adaptive CD8 response that makes TNF alpha, causes B cell differentiation into antibody secreting cells and ultimately antibody production um, and actually CTL, uh, cytotoxic T cell response uh, as well. And they identified 
a unique population of cells that were responsible for this. And as doing that, they were able to say, oh, these cells make IL-6 and IL-1 beta. In an experimental system, if we try and block them, can we block this response? And the answer is yes. So these folks get to publish in JCI because they've been able to show that you can inform yourself of what the difference between an AAV positive and negative person is and develop a strategy to block the things that have been primed that enable the um, seropositive donors to, to respond faster and worse. We haven't tried this in humans, or they haven't, but it's certainly a very promising strategy. Um, identify the players, block their effectors. So what about the innate immune response? I told you all immunology starts, the immune response start with the innate immune response, and then you, you activate the adaptive immune response. So what's going on with the immune, innate immune response here? You get an AAV infecting a cell. It gets internalized, and inside the cell, there are these TLRs, toll-like receptors, that see these danger motifs. And in this case, the ones that have been implicated are TLR2 and TLR9. These are things that see virus cap viral capsid, single-stranded DNA, things that look like virus, right? So it's saying, hey, I think I see something, and it's going to amount to this initial set of pro-inflammatory cytokines, these initial weapons of destruction, and then also tap the adaptive immune response to say, come in, help me, and in case we ever see this again, be prepared to see it, to fight it off faster. So these are the danger-associated molecular pattern receptors, the first line of the defense, and you can see that there are all these different uh, innate and adaptive uh, cells that make, have these receptors, specifically the macrophage dendritic populations there, those are the ones that are responsible for activating the immune, innate immunity uh, that, that uh, Mengozi was looking at, for instance. Uh, we don't know for sure if these are the same ones involved in the context of an inflammatory Duchenne response, but those are good candidates to look at. And we also know from Raj's, uh, Nagar Dr. Nagaraju's work that there are certain um, uh, TLR that are responsible for the immune pathology in Duchenne, and, and that one is TLR7. And we have, as immunologists, uh, drugs that are antagonists to these things. So if we really find out that these are issues and we want to block them, there are tools available that we could try. What about adaptive immunity? We were talking about adaptive immunity, and the, the hallmark of adaptive immunity is that on first injection, you have a naive cell, like a B cell, it has the specificity receptor, specific for capsid, peptide, whatever. And when it gets injected, those cells expand so that there's a whole bunch of them. And they differentiate into effectors that are really good at secreting antibodies. And those antibodies, as we mentioned before, aren't so great for, for the virus getting in. And then sort of to add insult to injury, that if you see it again, you make it more. And not only do you have more, but they're better at making the antibodies. So first you have some preformed antibodies you gotta deal with when the second, first, in, the time you get the repeat injection, but then you also have to deal with the fact that you've mounted even a larger immune response subsequently. So any of the downstream things are gonna be worse as well. Same thing happens with T cells. You start with an initial primary response with a certain magnitude and efficacy, and you develop cells that are memory cells so that if you see it again, you can remember what to do with it. And that memory can be, I remember to be aggressive to you. Or the memory can be, I remember to tolerate you. I'd like to promote tolerance <laughs> and limit aggression. So this is just to show you that there's lots of flavors of CD4 and CD8 cells. In fact, I had to pull a 10-year-old slide to fit it on here. There's so many populations now that you would be upset with me if I were to show you the number of possibilities. And in fact, they're so big that they have to um, uh, uh, use machine learning to, for us to, to see what they are. So what would be the deal with adaptive immunity specific for um, gene therapies is we could have a, an immune response to antibody response to the viral capsid that would block uh, infection, but we could also get T cell responses to dystrophin or AAV that, in muscles that are expressing them. 
which means you could go and clear all the muscle cells and destroy them because they were infected by something foreign. And that would be bad, but not horrible, but it could do that to your heart, hypothetically. And that would be bad. Now, this never been seen, and that's why we chose AV, because it's not so immunogenic, but the potential is there, and so it's, it's something to monitor and to make sure uh, we know what's going on. So what's this, the, 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 the goal there is maybe to use some of these immunosuppressants that are around that we already know about, and we can borrow from transplantation and immunity. Those include uh, rapamycin, which uh, Barry calls tacrolimus, is this mTOR inhibitors. Those tend to promote T regulatory cells at the expense of, and block T effector cells. That's a good one. Steroids do that too, so maybe they're not the blunt object we thought they were. There's lots of ways of, of inducing tolerance, and it's often due to the local environment. So like we showed you before, if IL-6 and IL-beta are there, you get mature dendritic cells that cause effectors that are bad, whereas if you have things like steroids or rapamycin, some of these immunosuppressors, you can induce tolerogenic response instead. And there, this is just to show that not specific for Duchenne, but in general, this is a really important question in autoimmunity and transplantation. So there's a, a whole slew of, of companies working on antigen-specific tolerance. And if we knew what type we wanted and how to make it, we could borrow from that field. The last thing I wanted to talk about is what about pre-exposure to dystrophin? Some of these boys have had exon skipping therapies. Some have had read-through therapies. Are these going to serve as vaccines to prime and, and eliminate the response to the, the gene therapy, or are they going to tolerize? The blessing might be that the low level of expression, generally speaking, low consistent levels of expression tolerize. It's not what the exon skipping folks were after, but it's what they got. So it's possible that those boys have actually tolerized and may do better. We don't know. Um, and then I just wanted to end with this last communication that I think is really very exciting that came out recently, again, by Bengozi's group, showing that in the context of AAV, if you use these rapamycin nanoparticles, you can um, prevent the activation of the immune response. And that's very similar to what Barry told you we just did in, in the mouse models. He used the same drug together with a drug that obliterates B cells, and the hope is that that will um, enable Readministration, because instead of inducing an immune response that's aggressive, you induce one that's tolerogenic. And then the last slide is just the same problem is going to happen with Cas6 to some degree, I mean Cas9 to some degree, and that's because it's a bacterial protein, and we know from different papers, again, you get different amounts, but a lot of people have caspid-specific T cells and antibodies because they've been exposed in the wild to those bacteria. And so we're either going to have to find alternate ones or ways of doing this or figure out how to immunosuppress again. And so we need to monitor the immune response. Uh, I like to do that by deep immune profiling. And if anyone would like to help me do that, they can see our nurse at one of these booths who will hand out consents that will allow you to send me your and your children's blood together with Stan. Of course, he does that hard for me. And so with that, uh, I just need to disclose uh, my, my uh, conflicts, potential conflicts.